<laughs> okay, I've got seven o'clock. So I suppose we really need to get started. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to begin with prayer. And I want to remember as we pray uh, the situation in Chad. I know some of you have seen in the paper the president-elect was killed in a battle. And there's a lot of unrest there. And uh, we have a very close friend that's a missionary there in Chad. Uh, for those of you who know Connie Wright, uh, she served with Connie at uh, Ready for a number of years. So Connie knows her well. And I had a note from Deb and uh, they're all safe and they're kind of hunkered down in a retreat area, but a uh, lot of uncertainty in that country. And uh, just another reminder that we need to read the papers with our faith in view, what's happening around the world. Let's just pray. Lord, again, thank you so much for your promise to be with us, to be with us as we study your word and to have your spirit speak to us. And to be with us when we go through challenging times, such as Deb is going through now in Chad and the other missionaries that are there. Protect them, protect the school that they're a part of, the missionary kids that are there at this time. Again, oversee all of that. They're your children. It's your school. Now guide us as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're in Daniel chapter 8, and uh, this is the second vision uh, that Daniel had, and this vision marks a major shift in the things that are happening in the book of Daniel. In chapter 7, Daniel was given a vision of the history overall with a certain emphasis on the final uh, period of time when the Antichrist comes, he's defeated by Jesus, who sets up his kingdom uh, on it. And we looked at that, and we looked at the Antichrist and the things he will do as he leads many into rebellion, uh, leads people into the worship of Satan, and so forth. In this chapter, uh, Daniel switches languages uh, from chapter 2, early in chapter 2, all the way through chapter 7. He wrote in Aramaic. Here he switches back uh, to Hebrew, and uh, probably the reason why he's done that is that the rest of this book of Daniel uh, deals primarily with events that surround Israel and what's going to happen to them and the impact it's going to have. So it would have been of special interest to the uh, Israelites, Hebrew being their language. Verse 1 gives us the background to that. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had a, oops, already appeared to me. I don't know if I'm on. You're on. You're on. Keep going, <laughs> okay. on. Yep. I told you I was going to pop stuff up, so. <laughs> yep. Okay. <clears throat> Daniel wrote this second vision uh, approximately two years after uh, the vision in, in chapter 7, and which means that this vision, like that one, uh, probably happened before uh, the incident of the handwriting on the wall and uh, Belshazzar's uh, demise following that. At this point, Daniel was probably close to 70 years of age. There is a small difference in chapter 7 uh, Daniel tells us that he received his vision uh, in a dream or received his information in a dream. Here he talks about receiving it in a vision. Uh, there's no significant difference in terms of the kind of material that was involved in that. Uh, the implication is that this one probably came to him while he was awake. That'd be a scary time. So um, we get on to verse 2. And it kind of presents some interesting information that is interesting only to those who are particularly curious of history <laughs> and doesn't really affect the, uh, the interpretation of the vision in the long run. But I kind of like it because I'm interested in history. So uh, <laughs> mom, go ahead and start reading verse two and I'm gonna 
pop up a map, so don't okay. worry if it goes away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Okay, so, so here's the map, and I would like to officially apologize for the quality of this map. I couldn't find a real good map, so I took a small map and blew it up really big, and now you, it's all messy and black. <laughs> it still shows Babylon, where Daniel was, and Susa, um, and the, the top river there um, by uh, Babylon, uh, above Babylon, that's the Tigris River, and the, the bottom river there underneath Babylon is the Euphrates River, Persian Gulf, and so you can kind of see uh, where it is. It, in, in Daniel chapter 8, it's really not clear exactly if he actually was in Susa physically or whether he was kind of transported there as part of a vision. Um, in, in another prophet Ezekiel wrote when he was in uh, Babylon, he was he was transported in the vision to Israel for his vision, but he wasn't actually physically there. And so that some have suggested Daniel was having this vision in Babylon, but he saw himself as being in Susa. Uh, Susa was located about uh, 150, about 200 miles. Um, southeast of Babylon, uh, about uh, 50 miles to 100 miles north of the Persian Gulf, somewhere right in there. At the time of Daniel's vision, Susa was not as important as it is going to become in, in a very short time. Uh, Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. He's the one that had the vision of the writing on the wall that we looked at earlier in this lesson. Um, he reigned He reigned probably, um, I think, 553 BC to 539 with the destruction of Babylon. And so this vision that takes place in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, about 550 BC, so probably 10 to 12 years before Belshazzar's death. Now, when Belshazzar dies, that's the time that Cyrus the Great, whose capital city was Susa, conquers Babylon. And so it's only going to be a, a dozen years, or eight, nine, ten years, before Susa becomes a very, very powerful city. And Susa becomes one of the three major capital cities of the Persian Empire, Susa, Babylon, and then eventually when um, Cyrus the Great gets up to Assyria and conquers Nineveh, those three uh, cities become the, the capital cities of the Persian Empire. And then Susa becomes more important in biblical history uh, a little bit later on because that's where Queen Esther is located. And so that's kind of how that all fits together there. <clears throat> it is possible that Daniel was there in the city of Susa on some kind of official business, uh, although it, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that because, like I said, it was still part of the Persian Empire and not part of the Babylonian Empire. Um, I, I find it interesting and, and saw on, on the web that... Uh, Back about 120 years ago or so, they were doing some archaeological digs in Susa and found the tablets of uh, Hammurabi, the, the Hammurabi Code. Uh, now, that code was written in the original Babylon about uh, 1,500 years before Daniel, but they found it right at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, and that kind of gave us a, a lot of information about uh, Babylon and, uh, and this, this whole time frame. Verse 27 in uh, Daniel chapter 8 mentions that um, he was able to go about the king's business, and which, which seems to indicate to me if he's going about the king's business, he's probably still there in Babylon, and it is a what we call a transportation via a vision. Uh, so he's not actually, I don't think he's actually in Susa, 
and he's actually in Babylon, but the vision is taking place in Susa. <clears throat> Elam is a, a small, you know, it was a small kingdom, part of the, eventually part of the Persian Empire, um, not, not very large, located in modern day Iran. Now, it talks about him being in the citadel of Susa, which does make sense. The Susa itself was kind of divided into two parts. You had the main part of the city um, where the common folk lived on this side of the Ulai, Ulai Canal that cut through the city. And then you had the Susa, the citadel of Susa which was the royal city uh, the, where the palace was and things. Kind of that Ulai um, Canal was there to <clears throat> kind of put a, a division in between um, the, the, the ruling party and the common folk, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, and so that, that canal is, was a man-made canal that passed right through the, the city. It brought water from the river into the city and, and did provide that protection for that palace complex. Verses three and four give us the first part of Daniel's vision, and that reads, I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. No doubt about what that vision means, because verse 20 interprets it for us. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Okay, now we've looked at other dreams similar to this uh, that uh, Daniel had, Nebuchadnezzar had, and this one, like them, uh, really fills in detail concerning uh, that Medo-Persian Empire. It accu accurately pictures the two divisions, one larger than the other. It talks about the spread uh, westward and uh, then north and, and south. Um, actually, the empire did do a little movement toward the east, but the primary direction in which it conquered was going uh, westward toward Egypt and Syria and all of those areas. So it uh, pictures that. And uh, the rapidness with which it uh, does is, is seen uh, there. That empire lasted about 200 years uh, before it was finally conquered by Alexander the Great. Verses five to seven uh, present the second part of that vision. And uh, that was regarding a goat. And verse 21 interprets that goat and reads. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The, the goat is described in verse five as having a prominent horn uh, between the eyes, came from the west and uh, conquered the whole known earth at that point. Uh, and so without even touching the ground, uh, the symbolism there, almost everyone agrees, is a reference to Alexander the Great, came from Greece, conquered literally everything in his path, moved at an unbelievable speed uh, throughout all of that. Uh, as noted in all of the visions, the accuracy of this uh, just is amazing. Uh, describing in prophecy, uh, Alexander in history records the accuracy of that. One interesting report says that when he kind of got as far uh, east as he could, conquered most of the uh, kingdoms around us, he sat there and cried because there were no other kingdoms to conquer. Verse 7, of course, deals with him uh, attacking and, and the swiftness uh, by which he 
actually defeated the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, Mom, can you read verse 7 while I pop up a picture of that? Because <laughs> I saw it attack the ram furiously, <laughs> striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. Uh, again, history records the swiftness in which Alexander defeated them. And really, it took less than half a, a year and a half and just completely wiped out the Persian Empire and, and was really a, a, such a thorough defeat that the, the Medo-Persian Empire pretty much ceased to exist. And uh, there is a passage in here, oh, verse 8. Let's talk about verse 8. Uh, it describes uh, the one who led them in the conquest, uh, the, the horn was broken off and replaced. Uh, Mom, can you read verse 8? And then also the interpretation of verse 8 is found up in verse 22. So let's do verse 8 and then drop down and do, look at verse 22. If you could read both of those, Mom, I think you're supposed to do that. Yep. Okay. In its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Now verse 22. In 22, says. the four horns that replaced the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. And so once again, when we look at what Daniel has written, we are amazed, I don't know if we should be, but we are amazed at the accuracy of the prophecy. I mean, God kind of knows what he's doing when he gives these prophecies. Uh, <laughs> but, but to look at what happened after Alexander the Great, um, is just amazing because Alexander the Great died uh, without having any uh, heir to the kingdom. And so initially his two sons took over. Um, they were not particularly good rulers. And so they were disposed of, if you know what I mean. And, and then <laughs> Alexander's kingdom was split four ways and, and between his leading generals. And four horns, four ways. And Daniel's description of what's going on, extremely accurate. Um, actually, uh, to be honest, uh, it was split five ways, but then the four guys ganged up on the other guy and took care of him. So there, there was really only four. <laughs> uh, and, so, and so, again, the, the accuracy is, 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 quite, is quite good. Verse 9 in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, introduces us to some new material uh, that would be uh, particularly important to the Israelites, uh, which I think is very interesting. Mom, verse 9. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. Now, we, we need to um, kind of remember again that this is this is a horn that's growing, but it's it's not the little horn of the end times, that Antichrist with a capital A, but it's it's a small horn, a small anti a, a Antichrist. Um, this horn will, ref although this horn does reflect many of the same characteristics of the the little horn of of the end times, and as we look through history around this time we're pretty sure we know who this small horn was. And it is a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. And let me see if I have his picture here. There we go. Oops. Ah! Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, if there is anyone who would be considered an antichrist realizing he lived 500 years before Christ, but still, uh, anti-God, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes would be him. Uh, he was extremely violently bitter against the Jewish people. He hated them and was determined to exterminate them and their religion. He went to war against Jerusalem uh, in 168 B.C., and uh, there was a, a, the report from, from the Jewish um, 
Jewish historians said that when he had conquered Jerusalem, then he immediately put to death 40,000 of its inhabitants, and then he sold another 40,000 into slavery. Um, he defiled their temple. Um, he took a pig into the altar and sacrificed a pig on the altar. Now, you know, pork is not something Jewish people, um, it's, it's not kosher, they're not supposed to be around it. Um, he went into the holy place and erected a, a shrine to, uh, to, to Zeus, uh, actually in the temple courtyard. He prohibited Jewish people from worshiping in the temple. Um, he told the Jewish men they were no longer allowed to be uh, circumcised, and if they were, they were to be executed. Uh, he tried to uh, gather up all the copies of the scripture that he could find and destroy them. Uh, he slaughtered anyone who was found in possession of scripture. Uh, he, he, this this was, was not a, a nice guy by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and uh, it eventually led to a massive rebellion. Um, in 164 BC in what historians call the Maccabean Revolt. And uh, there was a, a Jewish priest by the name of Matthias, and he had five sons who were um, pretty, pretty powerful people. And the, he, this, uh, Matthias and his five sons led this large-scale rebellion and uh, Matthias died in 166 BC and his son took over and his son, I love his son's name. It was Judah the Hammer Maccabee. Judah the Hammer. <laughs> Sounds like a wrestling name. In this corner, we have Judah the <laughs> Hammer Maccabee, six foot two, 195 pounds. Um, and <laughs> if your name is the Hammer, you know you've got uh, a pretty good history there. Um, and within two years of this revolt starting, um, they had they had pretty much successfully driven um, Antiochus Epiphanes and the Syrians out of Jerusalem, basically through guerrilla warf warfare, things like that. And one of the important things that um, they wanted to do was they wanted to cleanse the temple. Um, and they needed to take Jerusalem, they needed to take back to the temple. And when they, when they finally did take Jerusalem, uh, it was recorded that when they arrived in the city, they were just shocked at the condition of the temple. Uh, the doors were burnt down, the veil was torn off between the, the Holy and the Holy of Holies. Weeds had taken over the courtyards, um, just really, really bad situation. And so Judah... Of the hammer calls on his followers to help cleanse uh, the this temple and kind of rebuild its uh, its walls and 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 make it a nice temple again. The Jewish writings of Talmud, which is one of their key texts that they rely on for background material, uh, tells us that the uh, Judah Maccabees and the other Jews uh, took part in the rededication of that second temple that Nehemiah or Ezra had built and now uh, was in disrepair. And while they were in the process of that, uh, as far as they were concerned, a miracle took place. They discovered that they did not have enough of the special oils that were needed uh, for the menorah uh, that was lit with the candles. And so uh, they, decided what they would do was to light one candle and uh, when it burned out it was going to be burnt out because it would take uh, seven or eight days for a new uh, batch of oil to be processed properly and according to the Jewish tradition for which there's frankly very little historical evidence um, as it turns out that uh, menorah that one candle kept lit, staying lit uh, until all eight days were done and they had a fresh supply of it. And so as a result of that, the Jewish sages 
proclaimed that a yearly eight-day festival uh, would be held to celebrate uh, this miracle and the rededication of the temple, and it's called Hanukkah. Uh, today, uh, it's celebrated, uh, often called the Festival of Lights, uh, again, in remembrance of uh, that particular event. Hanukkah itself literally means dedication. The interesting thing is it's not one of those festivals that are focused uh, primarily on uh, Deuteronomy and the list that's there. Uh, that and Purim were added later uh, to the celebration. There is a reference to it in uh, John chapter 10, where it's called the Feast of Dedication, uh, again, celebrating the dedication, rededication of the temple back to God. A major part of that festival is the lighting of a nine stem menorah rather than the usual one. And they had nine stems on it, one for each of the days of the celebration, and then a center one that was used to light the other candles along the way. In many Jewish homes today, they have that uh, replica of that nine uh, stem menorah, and uh, they place it often uh, in a prominent place, often near a window, uh, as a testimony to the miracle of the Hakan Hanukkah oil that came. It's a fun time for Israelites. Uh, there are several aspects of that celebration. <clears throat> they cook a lot of foods and cook as many of them as they can in oil. Uh, and they eat those uh, <laughs> foods as a reminder of the special oil, oil of the miracle. I think I could go for that very much so. And uh, one of the special treats of that uh, celebration for Jews today is an abundance of donuts. Uh, <laughs> so they have plenty of them. They have evolved, it has evolved today into gift giving, uh, and especially in America, but uh, everywhere. Part of it is that Hanukkah falls very close to the Christmas season. And so they wanted to be able to have something that would be the counterpart of Christians uh, giving Christmas gifts to one another. And uh, some Jewish families actually use a tree that they call the Hanukkah bush uh, in their homes. And uh, one of the games they play is spin the dreidel. It's a y Yiddish game. And uh, it's played with a four-sided top uh, that... Uh, is used with letters on the different sides that spell the, fir the first letter of words for a great miracle has happened there. And by the way, in Israel, uh, they changed that to a great miracle happened here. But uh, the kids play it. It's a game. Uh, they get candy. They get coins and so forth for prizes. Uh, this year, if you're interested, uh, particularly in the donuts, uh, it's celebrated <laughs> from November 28th to December 6th. So, um, Ju Judas the Hammer uh, defeated Antiochus, and uh, it's, it's interesting to find out what happened to him. Uh, his, it, it's not recorded in our um, Protestant scriptures, but in the Apocrypha, which we talked about on our very first lesson, those books that are uh, historical in between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, if you read 2nd Maccabees, the Jewish writers are quite harsh, as I think they should be, um, with uh, how they describe the ending of, of, uh, of Antiochus Epiphanes. And so I'm going to have mom read 2nd Maccabees 9, 5 through 9. I'm assuming none of you can turn there in your Bibles, <laughs> but uh, we've got it printed out for mom, so we're, we're okay. <laughs> mom, it's a long passage, I know, but uh, go ahead and 2nd Maccabees chapter 9, verses 5 through 9. But the all-seeing Lord, the God of Israel, struck him with an incurable and invisible blow. As soon as he stopped speaking, he was seized with a pain in his bowels, for which there was no relief, 
and with sharp internal tortures, and that very justly, for he had tortured the bowels of others with many and strange inflictions. Yet he did not in any way stop his insolence, but was even more filled with arrogance, breathing fire in his rage against the Jews and giving orders to drive even faster. And so it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along, and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body. Thus he who only a little while before had thought in his superhuman arrogance that he could command the waves of the sea and had imagined that he could weigh the high mountains in a balance was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of God manifest to all. And so the ungodly man's body swarmed with worms, and while he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh rotted away, and because of the stench, the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. So I'm this hoping, is, this, I'm, I'm hoping that Andy isn't on with his popcorn. No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> not today. They're out camping somewhere. So. <laughs> but I'm sure he could tell you what disease it was, I'm sure. But whatever it was, it was fairly nasty. And, and the, uh, the writers of Maccabees were more than happy to tell us how bad this guy really was. Um, I find it very interesting. There's a section in there. Um, towards the end that says, and, and I'll read it again, just so you can, just so I can point it out. Um, he, he fell out of the chariot and it says he was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of God manifest to all. So the fact that he thought he was uh, so important that he could command waves and, and the sea and things, and now he has to be carried around in the litter just shows that that got the power of God and, and God manifests itself. Why I think that's so interesting is because that's what, that's what Antioch Epiphany's name means. The Epiphany's means God manifests. And so Antioch, his, his name means I'm God. And the uh, writer of the Maccabees says, and then the real God showed him who's really God. <laughs> Which it's I just it's think not it's, nice to to fool with Mother Nature. No, it's <laughs> or not. God. <laughs> Greek and and Roman historians uh, say that he eventually was traveling. Uh, he he fled, uh, basically fled Judah. Um, at the end of the revolt, he lost and and fled Judah across the Mediterranean Sea. He was basically turned away from every port that he tried to make landfall for. Uh, at. And so eventually, uh, because his body was so sick and, and everything was going wrong, he ended up just throwing himself into the sea to commit suicide and thus endeth uh, the abomination of desolation, Antiochus Epiphanes, the guy who thought he was God and, and found out he wasn't. Okay, let's go back real quick to uh, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, verse 9. Mom's already read it, but I just want to point out there uh, the last couple of words there in, um, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 9. It uh, talks nine. about the beautiful land. And uh, when I first read that, I thought, oh, it's got to be talking about Kenya. But then I found out, no, it's, <laughs> it's actually Israel. So uh, the promised land. Ezekiel 20, 15. Uh, records that uh, God said, do you have Ezekiel 15, 2015, no. mom? No. Uh, Ezekiel 2015 records God says, with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land, that I would bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all the lands. So I guess if God thinks Israel's beautiful, who am I to argue about him? <laughs> um Verse, verse 10 and 11 talks about the horn on the goat then, and it presents a, an interesting picture. Verse 10 and 11, Mom. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, <clears throat> and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. 
So this small horn that that is is Antiochus, um, grows grew up in his blasphemy. His blasphemy reaches the heavenly realms. Now a little bit later on in verse twenty four, um, which we'll, we'll is it, kind of the interpretation of this, and it indicates there that the hosts that is being talked about here are God's holy people, the the the, the Israelites. <laughs> Uh, in Genesis 15 and uh, again in Genesis 22, uh, God promises to Abraham that his descendants will be more numerous than the stars. And, and so that's kind of what is being talked about here, the starry host, the stars, the, 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 the nation of, of Israel, the, God's people. And the, the picture here in Daniel is that this little horn uh, not only sets himself up against God's people, but it sets himself up against God himself. And um, that, that uh, it talks about him, that, uh, about the little horn uh, trampling on them. And that's that severe persecution that they suffered, not being allowed to worship, having the scriptures burnt, uh, having a, an, an idol put up in the temple itself. There is a, a phrase in here and uh, that uh, some translations call, it's, it says, it's set, it is set up to be as great as the prince of hosts, or sometimes it says the great as the commander of the army of the Lord. Uh, regardless of how it's translated, that is, seems to be a reference to God himself, uh, who commands the angelic hosts and, and who will, if needed, uh, when needed, would do battle for God. Uh, God is the the host of the heaven the, the the commander of the heavenly hosts, um, and the essence of all this is that this little horn felt that he was bigger, stronger than God of Israel, and therefore he could attack God's people. We all know that very rarely works. <laughs> Verse twelve a states the reason that this evil one would be permitted to do as he would um, because of rebellion of God's people. And uh, first Maccabees one uh, chapter one notes that in this time there were actually uh, many of the uh, people in Israel had been less than faithful to God, and uh, indicates even that there were some that had turned away and were starting to worship the gods of the Greek uh, people, and so and so part of Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, being there was a, a punishment against the Israelites, uh, and then and then time was uh, taken. Uh, he was given a certain amount of time to rule. Verse <laughs> fourteen um, talks about uh, is is another very interesting passage. And verse verse thirteen, and it, it talks about how long will this. Uh, the, the Antiochus Epiphanes, this little horn, uh, how long will he hold power for? In verse 14, it kind of details the length of it uh, a little bit uh, cryptically. Mom? He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Um, so depending on who you look at in the commentaries, uh, this 2,300 evenings and mornings, uh, some commentaries look at this and say, well, 2,300 evenings and mornings means uh, 1,150 evenings and 1,150 mornings, and that's uh, approximately three years. Um, others look at this 2,300 evenings and mornings and say, well, no, and like in Genesis 1, it says it was evening, it was morning the first day. And so 2,300 evenings and mornings would be 2,300 days or nearly six years. And the problem is that both of those interpretations have some good points to them. Um, History records that Antiochus set up the altar to Zeus in the temple in December of 167 BC. Uh, that's in 1 Maccabees chapter 1. And Judas Maccabus, the hammer, 
uh, rededicated the temple in 164 BC, which was the three years. So if 2300 was three, three years, that's about what it is. Uh, the other issue is if you're talking 2300 being days and being six years, um, 164 back up six years to 170. Well, 170 AD was was the year that Antiochus kind of took control of things. He was actually um, in 175 AD. He he gained control by um, I don't know a good way to say it. He a guy died and he decided to seize control, but he couldn't do it by himself. So he took the guy's son, who was an infant, and basically took him hostage and declared uh, a co-regency with him and this infant son in 175. Well, in 170 AD, which would have been six years before the temple, <clears throat> Antiochus... Um, disposed of the young boy who is now six or seven years old and when i say disposed of you can imagine what i'm uh, he, yeah he, he had him killed and so the, there is there's so once 170 to, to 164 six years it works well with this prophecy as well and frankly we we really don't know um, which one he's talking about. But we do know that after the allotted time, whether it was three years or whether it was six years, um, the Bible says uh, the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. And today the Jewish people do celebrate Hanukkah uh, that in celebration of the rededication of the temple. And then verses 15 and 16 uh, Give us more interpretation of the vision. God wants us to know what's going on. Those verses read. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the <clears throat> Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. Um. Try to picture yourself being Daniel. I mean, we have trouble understanding all of this, being able to look back on history. But uh, Daniel doesn't have that backward look. Uh, this is going to be a strange situation. And he's looking at all of these things and uh, he's got, probably saying to himself, what in the world does this mean? It makes no sense. And uh, I'm sure that's a, a feeling we've all had at one time or another when we've tried to read and study God's word. The fortunate thing is that God has made a point of speaking to us in a way that, while it may be difficult to work on and so forth, can be understood. Uh, he wasn't speaking in riddles and hoping that someday uh, somebody would figure it out. Uh, he wanted to reveal himself. And if he's going to reveal himself, then we have to understand what he's saying. And so God spoke. Uh, it seems best to understand that phrase, the one who looked like a man, as being an appearance of God himself in the form of a man so he could communicate with uh, Daniel. God then directed Gabriel to explain it to Daniel. This is the first time in the Bible that an angel is given a name. Only two na angels are named in scripture. Uh, in addition to two references to Gabriel here in, in Daniel, in both here at 816 and 921, Gabriel is also mentioned in Luke 119. Uh, he's the one who announced to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, that uh, his wife Elizabeth was going to have a child. And when uh, Zacharias uh, kind of scoffed at that and said, no way, uh, Gabriel said, guess what? It will happen and you won't say a word until it does happen. <laughs> and they came out of the temple unable to speak. He's also the one who, according to Luke 126, 
uh, was given the task of approaching Mary with the news uh, that she would be the mother of the promised Messiah, uh, Jesus. The other angel who's mentioned in scripture is Michael. He's going to be referred to in chapter 10 of Daniel and uh, again in a couple times in chapter 10 and again in chapter 12. He's called the archangel, archangel in Jude 9 and in Revelation 12, 7, uh, he is seen as the angel who leads other angels in battle against Satan and uh, his angels, Satan's angels, which we know are our demons. So those are the only two names we actually have uh, of angels. When uh, we get to Daniel chapter, uh, uh, sorry, verse 17 in Daniel chapter 8, uh, we have a, a very typical response to um, God showing up or an angel showing up. Daniel describes his reaction and says, I was terrified and I fell down prostrate. <laughs> Um, it's, it's very interesting because pretty much every time either God shows up in scripture or angels show up in scripture, people are terrified. I mean, one of the first things they almost always have to say is don't be afraid. So uh, <laughs> I'm hoping eventually I'll meet an angel, but I'm hoping it won't be a scary one because it seems to be that angels were scary. Um, <laughs> And we don't know if, if he's actually seeing God or just seeing uh, Gabriel. But either way, um, he, he does what uh, what I think I will do and go weak in the knees and just face plant into the uh, into the ground. Um, and I think we can all kind of appreciate uh, uh, what uh, what Daniel's going through. I, I find it very interesting that um, even though uh, Daniel falls down and uh, uh, and if uh, the angel uh, kind of raises him up, lifts him up in Colossians chapter two, uh, when Paul is writing, he makes it clear that we're not supposed to worship the angels. Um, we're, we're to worship the creator, not the created. Uh, and angels have clearly been created. And there are two occasions in the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation 19, and then again in Revelation chapter 20 that John uh, does the same thing as Daniel. He sees an angel and he falls over and, and uh, to, to worship the angel. And both of those times, uh, the angel picks him up and says, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the word of this scroll. Worship God. And he says that in verse chapter 19 and then in chapter 22, and, I guess John forgot and fell down again because <laughs> another angel showed up. So and he's picked up again. Uh, and so that seems to be what happens here. Daniel falls down and, and uh, then he touched me and raised me to my feet there in verse 18. Um, <clears throat> Gabriel then addresses Daniel as, and I think this is very interesting. He said he, in, in, uh, he addresses him as son of man. Now, we talked about that being a title of Jesus, that Jesus used, but here it's used uh, differently. In fact, it's almost a different word. Um, and, and in fact, this uh, phrase, son of man, might better be translated son of Adam. And it's kind of used to emphasize that Daniel is, is a mere man. Uh, and so it's uh, kind of understandable that he's not able to to grasp the vision that he sees because he's 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 a he's a he's a human and uh and and therefore he he's he, he's got weaknesses um ezekiel in in his in his writing makes use of this son of man or son of adam uh, 93 different times he talks about son of man son of adam being you know he uh, people who have fallen uh, back to Daniel. Daniel uh, Gabriel goes on to tell Daniel that he would give to Daniel what he needed to understand the vision concerning the end times. And when we when we read this, the end times, we immediately think of this in terms of the end of history that we talked about um, last week in Daniel chapter seven. But I think here the phrase is used. Um, uh, as it often is in prophetic literature to describe 
the end of these prophesied events, that it's not really the end times, our end times, it's his end times and, and Antiochus. Uh, in this case, and then, yeah, I think in this case, it's uh, the end of, of Antiochus Epiphanes. Verse 19 through 26, guess what? We've already talked about it because we've looked down and, and back and forth. And basically, it's the interpretation of, of the vision. And so we're not going to read them now. Um, you can skim through them later if you want. Uh, there's a few nuances that are in there that uh, aren't obvious in the initial descriptions, but I think we covered most of them. But I do want to pop down to verse 27 with you just a little bit uh, before we end uh, tonight. Uh, verse 27 gives Daniel's reaction to all of this. <laughs> Mom. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Which makes sense because, you know, Daniel was close to 70 years old and we know. Hey, 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 you old, hey, 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 I'm just saying. <laughs> um, at this point, this whole experience has exhausted him to the point where he, you know, goes to bed for a couple of days and, um, and but again, I mean, he's 70 years old and that's still young enough to go about the king's business. So after several days of rest, he gets back up and, and gets back to work, even though he he's probably still doesn't understand it all. You know, and if if Daniel's prophecy is difficult for us to understand you know, from the from our position looking back on it, I, I can't even imagine what how much more difficult it would have been to try and understand these things from from Daniel's perspective another aspect of this for Daniel is this is talking about a terrible time that's going to uh, behold his people the Israelites it would be like someone coming along God saying today uh, to America uh, you know what uh, in three years or five years I'm going to send and then talk about incredible uh, atrocities committed to the American people and how we would feel about that. So Daniel was not only trying to understand what was not easy for him, but it dealt with his people and uh, he just, it was overwhelming to him. 